Welcome to the Age of Napoleon. Bonus episode, the 28th Messador of Matt Christman. Thanks for joining me. The people have spoken, and your top choice for the bonus episode topic was The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, an essay by Karl Marx published in 1852. I was planning on covering the top four vote-getters, but I had on a guest for this topic, and we ended up having so much to say that I decided to release this as a standalone and devote an entire episode to the other three topics. The 18th Brumaire is far from Marx's longest work. Most editions are under a hundred pages. But it's incredibly influential. Maybe the most famous maxim in Marx's entire corpus comes from the first chapter, that history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. If you had to describe the essay in one short sentence, you might say that Marx further develops his theory of class as the driver of history, or maybe that he illustrates how his theories might be applied to a real-life example. But as is typical of Marx, it also includes a lot of interesting digressions and asides. Before we get to our guest, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the background to this essay. 18th Brumaire is often considered one of Marx's most challenging works, and I think one of the biggest reasons for that is he was analyzing recent news. Marx wrote with the assumption his audience would be pretty familiar with the personalities and events he discusses. But the French Revolution of 1848 faded out of memory long ago, and it hasn't retained the same iconic status in the public consciousness as the Revolution of 1789. So you need a bit of a primer on this stuff to understand what Marx is getting at. The subject of the essay is the rise of Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of our Napoleon, first to the presidency of France's Second Republic in 1848, then to the position of emperor as Napoleon III in 1852. As to the title of the essay, the 18th of the month of Brumaire is a date from the notorious revolutionary calendar introduced in the First French Republic. The revolutionary calendar didn't stick around, but that particular date has remained famous because of a significant event that occurred on the 18th of Brumaire, year 8 of the Republic the coup d'etat that brought Napoleon to power in 1799. So Marx is telling us that he's talking about his nephew's seizure of power and comparing the two events. The revolution was on people's minds again in early 1848 because there was another radical insurrection. The workers of Paris again led the way, as heirs of the sans-culottes of France's first revolution. They took to the barricades against the business-friendly constitutional monarchy of King Louis-Philippe of Orléans and replaced his government with a left-wing republic. It seemed like the spirit of the Jacobins was reborn. But the new republic was quickly dominated by moderates and conservatives. Radicals were sidelined, and any who objected were violently suppressed in the name of law and order. Louis Bonaparte was elected as the first president, And it's hard to argue his victory was illegitimate. He won by a convincing margin with universal male suffrage. But Louis was no democratic champion of the masses. He was known as a centrist authoritarian with close ties to the army. He had even tried and failed to launch a military coup in 1836. How should a democratic government respond when the majority of the people seem to oppose democracy? It's a question that still comes up today. We don't have any easy answers now, and the French Republican politicians of the late 1840s couldn't figure it out either. Before his elected term was up, Louis Bonaparte became Emperor Napoleon III. For Marx and people like him, this was a catastrophe. Radicals all over Europe had applauded the early stages of the revolution, but that initial radical wave had been co-opted and rolled back by conservative elements, and it happened fast. The progressive republic that had shown so much promise to men like Marx had been nothing but a flash in the pan. Louis Bonaparte was, to put it kindly, not particularly notable for any talent or genius. None of France's conservative leadership was, 
So not only had the radicals lost, they suffered the added sting of losing to what they considered a bunch of morons. Marx and his comrades were left asking each other what had gone wrong, where had their French counterparts failed, and how had this idiot beaten them so quickly and so easily. The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon is Marx's attempt to address some of those questions. He looks at the material and political conditions that weakened and divided the enemies of Napoleon III and made him appealing to key parts of the population. This is pretty cutting-edge stuff at a time when most people still looked at events as driven primarily by personalities and fate. So with all that in mind, I'd like to bring in our guest. I don't plan on making guest appearances a regular thing, but I'm lucky enough to have a friend who's incredibly knowledgeable on this specific topic and a lot of fun to talk to, and it seemed too good an opportunity to pass up. His name is Matt Christman. His writing has appeared in Current Affairs and Jacobin Magazine, but you might know him best as co-host of the left-wing politics and satire podcast Chapo Trap House. Hello, Matt. Hi. So I wanted to start out with, you know, there's a very striking part at the beginning, probably the most famous part of the essay, where Marx talks about kind of his theory of history. What What's going on there? Well, he claims that he's sort of recapitulating Hegel and, and that Hegel had claimed that events and personages in history occur twice. And his wrinkle on it, his sort of witty uh, uh, elaboration is to say, the first time is a tragedy, and the second time it's a farce. And that related to what he's talking about, the tragedy, of course, is, the, is, uh, is Napoleon sort of ending the revolutionary period by seizing power. Uh, and then the farce is his total uh, incompetent, uh, dullard, what, nephew? What is he? Yeah. Taking power from... Uh, a collection of bourgeois uh, nitwits uh, who had seized power after uh, the 19, 1848 revolution, who styled themselves in many ways uh, after the original French Revolution, but well, revolutionaries, but had none of their vision or passion or, or idealism. Uh, and then and as they were a sorry sort of farcical recapitulation of the Jacobins, so too was Napoleon III, a very sorry recapitulation of, of the first Napoleon. And, you know, to Marx, that's kind of part of being human, right? Part of politics is hearkening back to these older, um, older eras of history. Yes. So Marx kind of breaks down French society into uh, classes and sort of charts their progress through uh, the 1848 revolution. Obviously for Marx, the most important is the proletariat. What's, what's his analysis of the proletariat in that period? Well, he, he sees uh, the, the working class uh, of, of France, specifically the Parisian proletariat, as a class that's sort of in that transitional phase from what he would call, and I believe in another work, uh, a class going from a class in itself to a class for itself, sort of recognizing interests that bind them all. And that's the, that sort of uh, emerging consciousness is, is the engine for uh, their revolutionary efforts. And he's very strong to point out that, that it is the Parisian workers who uh, overthrew the Orleanists and are the reason that there were even these, you know, these foppish uh, stockbrokers and bourgeois to even argue about what to replace them with. <laughs> but he is uh, also aware very much of the, the limitations of that consciousness, because at the end of the day, they were able to be basically corralled, first by the bourgeois, and then when they were sort of unable to find an accommodation between the, the divided sectors of that bourgeois by, uh, by the person of Napoleon III. Right, and he really criticizes the uh, alliance that the proletariat formed with the petite bourgeoisie, which he calls the Social Democratic Party, that alliance. What are his criticisms of that style of politics? Well, I mean, he's, he is aware 
that their alliance is not one that can withst- that can persist because the sort of revolutionary uh, slogans and language and and iconography uh, and and forms of the original uh, French Revolution that they were aping mask the class divisions that are the real fundamental shaper of the political reality. That that bourgeois and and those urban workers can never really be on the same side. But, you know, because of sort of that weight of history that Marx is always quick to emphasize, that the realization of that is sort of masked by by that, by those icons that, that people are sort of consciously and subconsciously reenacting. He goes into detail about this um, this phenomenon of the bourgeoisie labeling the things that are, were once seen as progress by this class of people come to be seen as anarchistic because they're no longer in their interest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the thing is that is that uh, those principles that are espoused by uh, a bourgeois that in the process of sort of taking power, uh, they're, they don't necessarily comport with any kind of real base idealism they comport first and foremost with their class interest. And that is what is going to guide their policies. It's not going to be any kind of adherence to any traditions that are going to conflict with their class rule. So for Marx, pretty much people are motivated by those interests rather than by, you know, any beliefs or ideology. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the farcical nature of it is that you have this emerging, the much um, a, 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 an urban working class in Paris in of the mid century that's much larger and uh, much more organized in many ways than the sans culotte might have been, but which are essentially mystified and have their revolutionary potential blunted by adherence to revolutionary traditions that are outmoded, that may have made sense in an era because Marx saw the original French Revolution as a bourgeois revolution and really because of the the progress that he saw as necessary the the transitional phase between between feudalism and capitalism as sort of a necessary stage uh and that ne- and he didn't necessarily think that that was the case that that bourgeois revolution was he believed by by the by that period in time he believed that in advanced countries of the west that the bourgeois revolution was was basically uh, finished, and it was at this point the mission of the, of the proletariat to take on their uh, historical place, basically as the, as the prime mover of history. But they were unable to do so uh, in part because of an adherence to radical traditions that were no longer applicable. Now, there's also another element of the proletariat that he discusses quite a bit in this, which is uh, the lumpen proletariat. And, you know, that's important because it stays untranslated from German, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, he says that there a line that really stuck out to me is that they're assembled to play the part of the people, which he compares to Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which I thought was a great image. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Lumpen Proletariat and what that m- term meant to Marx? Well, the Lumpen Proletariat, basically, I mean, you want to get a good word for it that would make sense to a modern audience would be like riffraff. <laughs> they're, they're the people in the cities who are not capitalists, but also are not part of the wage system and are and do not sell their labor. Petty criminals of, and the like, uh, sort of the shiftless unemployed. And uh, there is a great deal of sort of middle class propriety around Marx. And I do wonder to what degree his sort of visceral antipathy towards these people is generated by that. But uh, his essential point, though, and this is difficult to argue, is that they are by their nature incapable of organizing in a, along a, their axis as a class because they do not have a shared class interest the way that workers do. They are essentially individuals in the city in sort of a mirror way of the way that, um, that the peasantry in the countryside are not a class in themselves. And, that, and, and, and those are the two forces, the, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> that he sort of identifies as the two classes that were the most important in helping propel uh, Napoleon III to power. So, I mean, we're like 10 minutes in now. We haven't talked about Napoleon III yet. 
who is he to Marx? Who does he represent to Marx? What does his rise show? Oh, well, I mean, he is first and foremost for for Marx a buffoon. Right. <laughs> uh, his contempt is, is, is really brutal. I mean, if as a modern audience, it's like, imagine like the most epic John Stewart own of like <laughs> Donald Trump. Uh, it's, it's basically the same thing. So yeah, Marx first and foremost believed that Napoleon was an absolute fraud, uh, a crushing mediocrity. Uh, and the very fact that he was able to sort of fill the void of power in France at that time is what made that era such a farce to him because... It just showed sort of how institutions and uh, revolutionary mechanisms had decayed because it took, it took a figure like Napoleon Bonaparte to seize power uh, from the directory, but it was, a, it was a figure as farcically incompetent and uh, witless <laughs> as Napoleon III who could take power uh, in, in 1852 after the, the coup. Uh, and and the the essential thing that and the, and this is the other part of that that repeating concept of you know first is tragedy and, for, and second is for is that both figures Napoleon and Napoleon the third are dialectical figures in a way in that Napoleon the first Napoleon the OG the <laughs> the talented one his seizure of power was the resolution of a antagonism within French society. Uh, in the directory that was essentially irresolvable. And it was because the directory, uh, after having come into power after Thermidor, essentially had no real basis, social basis, right? Uh, there were there were few people within French society who were out of genuine conviction adhered and, and, um, and sworn to the directory. Uh, they, and as a result, they spent their entire time as an institution, essentially playing whack-a-mole with the left and right, because the, the actual energy and, and social basis in France at that time was both was the resurgent monarchism and uh, resurgent Jacobinism. And the directories spent its entire existence going after one and then the other and suppressing them in turn in order to maintain uh, this tenuous hold on power, the only justification for which was that, well, you know, uh, we have power, and, and it was basically for its own sake. And Napoleon essentially resolved that contradiction between those two things. He, he brought in elements of both and, and kind of embodied them in such a way that it resolved a lot of that social tension. And, the, and Napoleon III did a similar thing within the bourgeois, because uh, a lot of the 18th Brumaire is taken with ta uh, explaining in detail the conflicts within the bourgeois political parties that had emerged after the overthrow of, uh, of the Orléans. It essentially divides it into basically which sort of uh, constitutional monarchists they were. The, or, were they early Orleanists? Were they, were they for the Bourbons? Were they, Napole were they Bonapartists? And it, it they roughly corresponds to uh, different uh, sections of the French bourgeois economy. Landowners were, were Bourbonists uh, and uh, people in the emerging uh, trades and, and specifically in the stock market were for uh, the Orléans. And their attempt to form a government basically on top of this restive urban proletariat that had brought them to power, and, uh, but that what they had no trust of and no desire to see uh, actually elevated, uh, their failure to find some sort of modus vivendi left this basic, this vacuum and this crisis at the center of power, and it was filled by Napoleon III. His 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 popularity with the the peasantry, uh, his popularity on the streets of Paris, his popularity with the with the military, essentially gave the restive and and battling factions within French bourgeois society a figure to sort of resolve all uh, conflicts within. And so that's another thing that is an echo of the original of the original seizure of power, but again, made farcical by just the squalid nature of the conflict and the absolute dismal personal nature of Napoleon III. <laughs> Very well put. So I think the last piece of the puzzle here 
and it's the last one that Marx kind of adds to this uh, horrible tapestry is the peasants. So mm-hmm. the sack of potatoes, the troglodytes. The sack of the potatoes, yes. What, why were they a sack of potatoes and what made them Bonapartists? In my opinion, it's, it's the most resonant part of the book for a contemporary American, which seems counterintuitive. But uh, for me, when you read about him talking about the sack of potatoes, so basically what he's saying is he's describing the, uh, the rural peasantry who made up the majority of French society at that time, who voted overwhelmingly in the plebiscite to ratify Napoleon III's seizure of power. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, there is no way that you could describe them as, as capitalists. You know, the language of the kulak had not yet been invented. <laughs> they were not, by anybody's understanding of the term, a capitalist class. So in, in his attempt to explain why they were essentially such a reactionary force, Marx es- ex- explains that what generates class consciousness and what, what makes the proletariat, the working class, the engine of the next s- stage of history is that they... They share a common experience and a common uh, economic relationship, a common geographic space. They live in neighborhoods together, very closely packed. They work in factories next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. And the experience of that is what generates class consciousness. Rural peasants, even though they are not capitalists and have no interest in the capitalist class, do not share an experience the same way. And as such, they are collective will, as expressed in something like the plebiscite vote, cannot express a unified class interest. And that's where the potatoes come in. Uh, so I remember the, when, I was like, when I was like a teenager and I first, somebody evoked that quote, it was in the, in the context of sort of slagging Marx as someone who sort of like had just nothing but disdain for peasants and thought that they were, you know, uh, worthless that's not accurate. Like many of the most famous Marx quotes, the context changes. The same thing as opium of the people. The context really changes the sort of received meaning of it. The analogy he puts is that so you get a bunch of working class people together. Their shared experience will create, as I said earlier, it will make them go from being a class in itself to a class for itself. Their common experience will generate understanding of a common goal and common interest. And he says that that doesn't happen with peasants because they are so isolated from each other. Their, li- their work lives are them and their families, basically. Maybe they, they might see just their neighbors. They don't have common experience. They don't have a common antagonistic figure like, like the bosses that urban workers do. And so he said, it's the same way. We're getting a bunch of peasants together to vote, for example, it's the same as if you put a bunch of potatoes in a sack, you don't get a new thing. You just have a sack of potatoes. The, all you've done is brought them together. That bringing them, them together has not, has not created a new thing. The way that bringing a bunch of workers together and having them express an interest will bring forth you know, a, a self-conscious class. Uh, and the reason I find that so evocative is because I really feel like even though there, Marx had no vocabulary for modern American uh, work life and class system. I don't, I mean, we, we're so far beyond, I think, his or anyone's reasonable projections of how society would end up being that far away from their life experience. But I feel like of all of his descriptions of classes and all in his writing, the one that most evokes contemporary American life is the sack of potatoes. Because even if we might be what would be technically termed as a working class, things like suburbanization and mass media have siloed us in a way that he would not have anticipated for workers to be. And so we're still a sack, even though we're not, even though barely any of us work in, in, um, in agriculture, our lived experiences are such that we are essentially the potatoes in the sack, but because we're postmodern potatoes in a sack, I guess we'd be Pringles <laughs> in a tube. And like, that's how you, that's how a figure like Donald Trump makes sense because he, that's why I said, you know, read, read Marx on Bonaparte and Napoleon the third. And it's very much reminiscent of contemporary people writing in horror at Trump. 
uh, just an absolute fraudulent figure stumbling into the, to power because of the collapse of all other institutional authority. Uh, and that, and in both cases, what ratifies it is is a mass of people who are exploited or are have no interest in the current uh, economic structure and, and class rule, but who are incapable of expressing a collective class interest. And then, as in the case of Napoleon, falling back on nostalgia, essentially, and remembering the glory of Bonaparte and, and wanting to sort of reassert their desire for that. Or in contemporary America, since we don't really have mem- historical memory, we just we have uh, mass media instead, <laughs> what sort of is grabbing and evocative uh, in mass media, which is, of course, would be a game show host. <laughs> oh. Very well put. Thank you, man. Just a couple more things I wanted to touch on before we wrap up. H- how do you place this in the broader... You know, how does this fit in the rest of Marxist thought? What's significant about 18 Brumaire to Marxism as a philosophy? Uh, well, I feel like it has some of the most uh, useful and evocative breakdowns of the mechanisms of, of how class rule plays out. Like specifically, his description of the conflict within the Fr- the French bourgeois that led to Napoleon, I think, is uh, is very important because sort of the bolderized Marx, and, and I think I don't know, reflexive anti-authoritarianism tends to create in the mind these sort of uh, undifferentiated classes uh, in terms of you know uh, ruling. And, 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 and like it's a, a single a singularity of purpose that uh, is not the case that uh, for a bourgeois for a capitalist class uh, there might be they might there might be a unity of purpose in seeing the capitalist system maintained and forestalling any kind of revolution maintaining uh, you know private property and all that but because of the alienated and uh, unrestrained nature of capitalism itself, those segments within a ruling class uh, will not necessarily have the same interests and will, con- will will come into conflict. And that's how figures like Napoleon III emerge, is to resolve those tensions. And I think that's something that to this day is very uh, useful to remember when trying to analyze like what a capitalist government is doing, what capitalist interests are, because uh, that can mean different things for different segments of uh, of a capitalist class. So I think that's that's good. I feel like his, uh, like I said, his breaking down of spe- exactly why the working class is the engine of history as he saw it, and and why other classes are prevented from reaching that apotheosis is also very important because it's really the only way to make sense of things like you know, uh, all of these people in France voting to affirm this, this incompetent and incredibly corrupt Claude <laughs> as, their, as their new emperor, or, you know, uh, as I said earlier, contemporary uh, events. Well, thank you very much, Matt. That was, that was really interesting. As always, you're very eloquent on this stuff, and I really appreciate you coming in and being the first ever guest on the show. It's a, it's a real honor. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the show, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Now that you... I, when the last one dropped and you're like, okay, we're starting uh, from Napoleon's point of view, I was like, fuck yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Good to hear. Thank you.